Episode 186, Spitting Venom. It would be great if they could master the technique of harvesting salt. It would be much easier for the beastmen in this village. They could even exchange salt with the other tribes and prosper from the trade. Caspian, who was proud of this, said with a smile, This is an ability possessed only by us Mer. I can remove the oxygen from the seawater and let the females live in the sea, and I can also separate salt from the seawater. You won't be able to do it. Blair was shocked. So that's how you harvest salt. But salt crystals would form by themselves in the cracks of some reefs, just like the one Stephen brought back. Caspian said after a glance at the salt in Blair's bowl, one look and I can tell this salt is not harvested by us. The color is mixed and there are impurities inside. Brilliant. Blair expressed her admiration. Then how much salt can you harvest in a day? Only upon hearing this question, Caspian sensed a plot brewing. He stared at Blair and asked, Why are you asking? Can you help them harvest salt? They'll give you compensation, said Blair. That's impossible. Caspian refused immediately, sounding quite agitated. Why? Caspian bit a chunk of the meat and said, Harvesting salt is a painful and slow process that consumes a lot of energy. Each merman only has to turn in one fistful of crystallized salt every year, and that's it. Forget it, then. One fistful might not be enough. Blair hurriedly shook her head. The tribal head, who had his ears pricked up as he listened in on their conversation, felt his hopes dashed at this revelation. Stephen suddenly looked up at the tribal head and asked, Which merfolk tribe are you going to exchange salt with? The three-striped tribal head felt a chill run down his spine for some reason under the stare of the snake. That fear that arose in his heart baffled him. The merfolk tribe over at the sea cliff is the closest to us. Their terms are also fairer. Hence, we usually go there. Exchange with a different group, said Stephen calmly. The displeased tribal head was about to say something when Rex suddenly said, Listen to him. Your majesty? The tribal head was perplexed. After the tiger king swept his gaze over him, he immediately swallowed his words and said respectfully, Yes, we will go to another group of merfolk. Caspian, who was in the midst of eating, froze. He could vaguely sense that all was lost for the tribe he used to belong to. Caspian's favorite water wheel was still spinning noisily, forming ripples on the water continuously, drenching the air above in the color of blood that persisted. Everyone dispersed after eating their fill. After Blair left, Caspian, who found the water too filthy, transformed into a human and went to look for a clean water source. When he returned to the tree hole, Stephen refused to move to another story after eating his meal, simply spreading out his body on the floor to digest his food. With the leopard cubs grown up, once Stephen lay down, the tree hole became incredibly cramped. The cubs were huddled on the bed as they licked their toes leisurely. Blair gazed at their faces and, after confirmation over a long while, finally asked Roger... Do you find their mouths flat? No, Roger replied without even looking. He asked in confusion, What makes you say so? Roar? The three leopard cubs raised their heads and gazed at their mommy with a hurt expression, then gazed at each other's mouths. Are our mouths flat? What does that even mean? Relieved, Blair said curiously, I remember their mouths being very flat when they were just born. Their mouths were very flat even when they didn't have much fur. I wondered, once their fur grows out, wouldn't their mouths become even flatter? That's why I'm concerned. If it wasn't for the fact that her cubs look normal now, Blair wouldn't have dared to bring it up. 
She was really very worried that her kids were affected by her human genes. Leopard cubs are like that. The amused Roger poked Blair on her smooth forehead. Tiger cubs and wolf pups also have flat mouths when they are just born. Have you never seen leopards and tigers before? No, Blair confessed honestly. She had seen a dog before, but not a newborn one. She suddenly felt a weight upon her arms as her three cubs bit her sleeves to vent their emotions. Blair stroked their heads one by one and coaxed, My babies are the cutest. Roar! She coaxed the cubs a long time before they finally calmed down and drifted off to slumberland next to their mother. The next morning, 30 young and strong tiger beast men set off for the sea with the entire tribe's food on their shoulders. As the weather grew increasingly warm, Blair could no longer bear to stay indoors after tolerating it for several months. Seeing that the weather was pleasant today, she went out of the tree hole for a breather. The accumulated snow had melted and moistened the earth. Tender grass had grown from the soil, and the air was filled with botanical fragrance mixed with the scent of soil. Blair took in a deep breath, feeling the vigor of spring infuse into her internal organs. Not far away stood a female under a tree, staring fixedly at her. Blair took a close look and revealed a delighted look when she realized who it was. Donna! Zeke fixed the hat tightly on Donna and said, I was just encouraging her to come out to walk around, but she was refusing me. I'm glad you showed up. Leave it to me. Blair gazed at Donna up close and saw that her eyes were evasive. She seemed eager to hide. Let's go out for a walk. You're safe with me. Stephanie had filled up a small bag with potatoes and was looking for Blair to chill with her. At the sight of her, she shouted, Blair, let's go and check out the white ginger. Startled by the voice, Donna subconsciously squirmed into Zeke's arms. The latter hurriedly circled his arms around her to calm her down. Blair glared at Stephanie, who shrugged in return. She said, much more softly this time, I want to go and see the white ginger. Are you coming with me? Blair didn't wish to go somewhere far, but as she gazed at Donna, she decided to let her make the decision. Donna, do you want to go? To everyone's surprise, Donna nodded after a moment's hesitation and even uttered out an, Okay. Ecstatic by her response, Blair decided to set off right away. Wait a minute. I'm bringing along my mates, Blair said, then ran back home. With Roger and her leopard cubs going along with them, the entourage set off for the white ginger field. The white ginger field was covered in green and white, looking even better than the ones grown in the village. As there weren't tall plants in the field... When the sun shone upon it, the females couldn't stand the heat in their thick clothing. Stephanie and Donna both removed their animal skin coats. Why aren't you removing your clothes? It's so hot. Stephanie felt hot just looking at Blair, who was wrapped up in thick fur like a bear. Blair flushed. Tiny beads of perspiration had formed on her face. I'm not hot. Whoops. She had made all the clothes she needed to wear in the cold season, but forgot to make a tube top for the hot season. She was naked inside, so how could she remove her clothes? Wait a minute. Blair suddenly recalled that she had yet to squeeze out milk for her cubs today. As the cubs had filled their tummies with plenty of meat yesterday, they didn't pester her like they usually did. That was the reason she hadn't squeezed even once up till now. It was time to wean them off breast milk. Stephanie cast a strange look at her, but didn't ask her any questions. She laid on her belly as she took in the scent of the white ginger. Ah, it's this smell. Is there a need to overreact? 
Blair also sniffed the flowers, but didn't detect any difference. Stephanie said, I'm coming of age this year. Sniffing white ginger will help me go into heat. Upon hearing this, Zeke also let Donna sniff it. Blair, who couldn't bear to watch this, looked into the distance, and she saw that elsewhere, other females were sniffing the white ginger too. She was speechless. Just as she was about to shift her gaze away, the figure of a snake entered her vision. Stephen? The snake was very fast, and in the blink of an eye, he appeared before Blair and transformed his upper body into its human form. Are those scorpion beast men still pestering you? Stephen asked with a frown. He instantly knew what was going on when he saw that the surveillance in the Diger village was tighter than usual. Blair gave Stephen a helpless gaze. I'll kill them. The murderous intent in Stephen's voice was unmistakable. Zeke couldn't help but look towards him, wondering what gave this stripeless snake beast man the confidence to declare he was going to kill a group of scorpion beastmen? but for some reason he didn't dare to voice out his thoughts. Blair hurriedly said, Don't. What if you accidentally kill a good scorpion? It has been a long time since their last attack. Perhaps they've given up on this thought. Rex only asked them to stay alert because he is worried. Stephen looked impatient, though he didn't insist. Very quickly, though, Reality gave Blair a tight slap in the face. That afternoon, the tiger beast men who went out to exchange for salt returned, but the meat upon their shoulders was gone. The moment they exited the village, they were ambushed by the scorpion tribe. Instead of battling them, the scorpions focused on destroying the food, spitting venom all over the meat that they couldn't bear to eat the entire cold season. The temperature was sufficiently high that if they were to make smoked meat now, it would certainly rot. Their hopes of having salt this year were dashed. Silence emanated throughout the entire village. Blair gazed outside the tree hole and could sense the ostracizing and hateful gazes of the females, which was presented more directly this time. The tribal head was simmering with anger. They have got their eye on us. They aren't giving up so easily. This is only the first year. What are we going to do in the second, third year? Us males might be able to go without salt, but our females can't. Overwhelmed by despair, the tribal head's fear and respect for his king vanished. Articulating each word clearly, he said, Your Majesty... Are you really going to let our tribe perish for the sake of one female? The scar on Rex's face twitched slightly as his expression turned ferocious. His gaze coldly swept over the tribal head as he said in his deep voice, I will answer to the tiger tribe. Then drive Blair out, hollered the tribal head. Dad... Stephanie pulled the tribal head's hand. Gazing at his female cub, the tribal head's expression eased slightly. Blair turned her head towards Stephen and Roger. She said dejectedly, We'd better leave from here. Rex remained solid as a rock in the face of everyone's queries. The root cause of the matter is that we're not strong enough. You think that by relenting, the Scorpion tribe will let the Tiger tribe off? Rex said in a cold voice. They have a clear grasp of things around here. Even without Blair, they will come to snatch other females. The tribal head's face turned pale. Then what are you planning to do? Kill them all. Before Rex could reply, Stephen's icy voice entered their ears. He slithered out from the tree hole, exuding a mighty aura. Even with no animal stripes, others couldn't help but look upon him as a powerful beast man. Kill them all, and the matter will be resolved, 
Stephen swept his gaze over Rex before turning around and preparing to leave. Rex immediately said, I'll go. Stephen halted in his tracks. You're not suited for the high temperatures of the desert in the day. It's more appropriate for me to go, Rex analyzed. Their tribe's advantage is their numbers. Not all the scorpion beastmen can bring together so many of their kind. It must be the leader of the scorpion tribe behind us. Once we kill their leader, scorpion tribe won't ever invade our village again. <laughs> <laughs> 